and welcome to Curator Chats with the Museum Center at Five Points. I'm Lindsay. I'm the Curator of Collections here. I'm Hope. I'm the Curator of Education. And we're re-recording this. Um, so you might notice we're actually back together in the same room. The museum is now open. We are practicing social distancing procedures as advised by the CDC. Um, and we have been trying to figure out how to record here rather than over Skype. And it's been a process. I think this is our third try. <laughs> this is our third try. Who would have thought Skype would be easier? Yeah, who would have thought? Yeah, first time we couldn't get the camera working. The battery was dead. Um, it was saying there was no memory card, even though there was. It was a bunch of stuff. And then we just recorded our entire curator chat. One, not realizing that we didn't pay attention to the 20-minute limitation. So we recorded a lot that was not recorded. Uh, that the mic that we have set up was not on, so there was no sound. And we were out of focus and blurry. So we are hoping that we are in focus and you can see us clearly and hear us clearly. Yeah, we're hoping this might work because I thought that camera had a mic, but who knows? Who Maybe knows? Not. Let's let's address one thing. Elijah is not here with us. Um, Elijah has moved on to a different job, so he will not be on this or on the podcast with us anymore. I think he's on the next two. Yeah, he'll be on the next two podcasts, but once we start recording our new set in person again, yeah. um, he won't be with us. Yeah, he. it was an amicable party. Um, he's just at a different stage in his life and he's moving on. So for now, it's me and Hope. And Today our topic is going to be uh, scary museums and artifacts, essentially. We're going to be talking about uh, those things about museums and historic sites and things like that that scare us. Okay, <laughs> so first question is, what are some of the scariest museums, intentional or otherwise, that you've been to? Okay, so I have been to like a torture museum mm -hmm. that I think the artifacts in those are a little bit eerie. Um, the museum that I personally went to was like lit like this room with white walls. It was like very open. It also had car it had carpet. That's like the only other I think. That's like the only other museum I've ever been to with carpet. Museums shouldn't have carpet. Um don't get me started. Don't but, get me started on carpet. Um I, that I think that is like a little bit eerie. And then I think I've been to some like sites in different places that have been a little bit eerie, like Greyfriars Kirkyard in Edinburgh. Um, it's this like very old like cemetery that surrounds um, Greyfriars Kirk. And it's got like kind of like stonework everywhere, so you can hear your footsteps echoing. It's a stunningly beautiful place. There's cherry blossoms in the summer, but it's still kind of like eerie. And there's this story about a man that's buried there. His name is like Sir Mackenzie. That's his last name. And they call him Bloody Mackenzie. So, and I just kind of the nickname front. But basically, there was this thing in the 1600s in Scotland where they were going to have a national religion. And if you didn't want to have the national religion, you didn't have a choice. And you would be like arrested and tortured, and that was his job. So, they used to have these tours of this place, and you could like go into like little like, hidden passageways and stuff that people were like, getting hurt and they said that it was like Bloody Mackenzie like attacking people. Um, so they kind of put an end to that. But this is one of Scotland's like most haunted places according to the internet. Um, okay. I've never actually talked to anyone in Scotland that's been like, yeah, it's the most haunted place there. I don't know. Um, but there is that and then there's like this, there's like just creepy things there. There's like skulls and crossbones everywhere. And there's this um, one mausoleum that I remember like vividly. So it's like a little mausoleum. And on the front, it's got like almost like bars in a jail would have, you know, like the little bars. Um, and there's a statue behind the bars. And he's like holding a bottle with a drink. But then kids sneak into these places to drink. So there's like broken bottles and like alcohol on the ground. And it just like, you don't, you can't see him from far away when you get up close. He's just like standing right there. And it's very lifelike. And that was very terrifying. I think I screamed. Um, my mom cackled hysterically. But yeah, so I think just kind of places like that and the torture museums, like 
Yeah, yeah, I went to a torture museum as well in Germany. Um, I think you, on our first recording, you said that was in Prague. <laughs> yes, that one was in So, Europe. mainland Europe, essentially. Um, yeah, I went to one in Germany. I was an exchange student. I was about 14 years old uh, with a group of other, like, 12 to 16-year-olds. Um, and it was this little hole in the wall. You would have missed it if you weren't paying attention or you weren't looking for it. Um, it was lit with like a 10 watt incandescent bulb. It was so dark. Uh, they really went for the atmospheric aspect of the torture museum. And I think it would have been a lot scarier if I weren't with other 12 to 16 year olds who were having the time of their life. Uh, it was, we spent more time laughing about the things that were in there, like the, uh, the spreading pear or whatever oh, it's called. Yeah. Yeah, because that goes up your butt hole. Yeah, Were the, was it in English there? Did you read it all in English, or did you have to read it in German? I think it was in German. Okay, I think that I I think I read it in English, so it was a little bit eerier because I don't speak. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, there was such a little hole in the wall. I don't remember if there was English signage because um, it was so. Obscure, right? Um, Lindsay speaks German, by the way. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I speak German, so I could read it um, a fair amount. I mean, I was only 14 at the time. I had maybe one or two years of German, so I understood it okay. But at the same time, our German teacher didn't necessarily teach us words that you would use to describe torture implements. That's true. So, you know, there was there was some understanding of what it was, uh, but this was this was so long ago, this was 15 years ago. Um, I can't remember if there was any signage in English, but I just I just want to say I was in that torture museum 15 years ago. Today. Oh, I mean four years ago today. Oh, here <laughs> ago today I was here. <laughs> like four years ago today. Yeah, I didn't remember you taking a trip to Prague <laughs> last year, but what a day. Yeah, what a day. <laughs> Went to Prague for a day. Guys didn't know it. It was on a weekend trip. It was just a quick, like, yeah, back and forth. Um, another place that I went to that the it wasn't that the museum was scary. It was the surroundings. Uh, Courtney, my sister, and I went to Aokigahara, which is the suicide forest in Japan. It's around Mount Fuji. Uh, we went to their museum. It was more of a nature museum. They, it was near the, they have a bat cave that you can go into. Um, it was near that, and they had natural things in there. And they had a gift shop. And Courtney went and bought a little pink plushie of Mount Fuji. She was pink. She had a little cute Japanese face with little eyelashes and a flower on Mount Fuji. Um, she was adorable and she would like sing a song. Um, so she, my sister bought that in the gift shop. And that wasn't, that wasn't the terrifying part. It was actually going out into the suicide forest. Um, so I was there and we had ridden a bus. I think we were some of the only obviously foreign tourists. Um, and we were riding this local bus because um, we took we took the train there and then took the bus and I, I don't know if that's the way that most tourists go there. They probably go on tour buses and we just took local transportation. Um, so we rode out to Mount Fuji on a local train, uh, went on a little local bus and we got off at one part of it and I was just using a map and Jap my Japanese to figure out where these trails were. And we went there and there were no tourists. I thought, of course, the suicide forest is gonna be crawling with tourists because it's such a hot spot for uh, those scary tourism, deadly tourism, whatever you wanna call it. Extreme tourism, maybe. And then after, um, everything that happened on YouTube, it's become like 
Oh, well, I think we went before that. We went in 2016. Oh, okay. I think that might have been 2017 or 18, but someone went into the forest and filmed the body. Yeah. And it was put on YouTube, and there was so much backlash that that's what was most popular. Yeah, um, we went uh, before that, I believe. Uh, we went in 2016, fall of 2016. And um, I was living there at the time, and Courtney came to visit for about 10 days. And we went through, we started walking a trail, and there were no locals, there were no tourists, we were completely alone. And just, I think they say it's the topography or it's the geological structure that's there. There were no sounds. It was dead silent except for our own voices and the sounds we were making. There were no animals. There was no like ambient forest sounds that you expect. Right. Forests are loud. They, I mean, yeah, there's like birds and animals and yeah. crickets. There's and light. Yes, yeah, so much. Um, and it was almost oppressive. It was like one of those sound rooms that absorb all the sound. And I think we went in an area that's not tourist friendly because the signs were either rusted or broken, falling apart. Um, there was a cave there. Uh, and that's, that's what all the signs were related to. Most most of the stories you hear about the suicide forest say they have signs saying you have so much to live for, things like that to deter suicides. But these signs were all about don't enter this cave. And my sister and I, we kind of approached the cave and trying to dare each other to go in until we heard a sound from the cave and we both booked it. Um, so we did not go in that cave. Um, yeah, so that's, that was, that was pretty scary. Um, I went to the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin at one point. This was also when I was 14, but I wasn't with the tour group. I was with my host family. Um, and it was very somber, but it was also very eerie. Um, that is the place with all the stone, gray stone blocks, and everybody was dead silent. Everybody was very somber, and it was just a very eerie feeling. I don't want to say it was scary. It was just you so see the chills. To, I think you're so used to when you're in a place like it really anywhere, like a large public space, it's, it's very loud. Yeah, it was so quiet. It was also gray and rainy that day, and this was outdoors. So it was very appropriate, and the mood was just very toned down and very serious. And I know that there have been some people who apparently goof around in that area. That wasn't the case when I was there 15 years ago, right. but I don't know how it is today. Um, nobody was taking selfies or anything like that. We were all very quiet and just, just a very easy atmosphere there as well. Um, I think in the first recording you talked about the Voodoo Museum. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. So, and this is probably like, per this was just like a personal thing, um, but, if, okay, so I'm from Louisiana. I've been to New Orleans a lot of times. And the first time that I went, I was pretty young. I think it was like seven or eight. I was a kid. And we went to a voodoo museum. And one of the things to know about voodoo is it doesn't work if you don't believe. So, like, if you don't believe in voodoo, you have, like, nothing to fear from it. From what I understand. Um, so we went to this museum. It was a nice little museum. It really was terrified me, absolutely, like, scared me to death. I was, um, there was, like, a film that they played, like, a little, like, interview process. It scared me so bad, like, I begged to leave. And this was, like, 20 years ago, and I've never been back to that museum. But it's, like, quite close to the corner, as, like, if I remember correctly, but I've never been back, won't go back. And I've been to the city, like, more than 20 times, probably. And I refused to go to this museum. I don't know what it was. There was something bad happening there, but it just scared me to death. Like I, like I still, I still can't. Like I will never go back there. It was terrifying. Um, and it was just like the Voodoo Museum, like the history of the Voodoo Museum. It's just very like. And I've been into there's like Marie Laveau's House of Voodoo as well. Okay. Like, yeah. And that is um, it's like a shop, and you can like leave offerings and everything. And that place, I've been in there multiple times. It's just lovely. Awesome. But that one museum, like, and I've never ever had that reaction at a museum before, um, like from like the place itself. I, I think I've seen two exhibits in museums, but I've never had that like I can't be there, especially as a child, because I think there was a 
tells you I'm going to be there, with, like with our group. Yeah. And I just, I just <laughs> don't want to go there. Never will. Next question um, Are there any scary museums that you really want to visit? I really want to go to the Warren Museum. Um, Edward and Warren have that like occult object museum um, of. Like if every time that they went on a case, they took an object back. Mm -hmm. So they have the Annabelle doll, and they have like a gravestone that was used for like satanic rituals, and just like all kinds of like eerie things in there. And I'd really like to see it, but um, I'm a not sure if it's open anymore because she died last year, okay. and he died before that. So um, I don't know who would run it. But also, it was never a museum that you could just go to. You needed like tickets to an event or something, so I'm not sure what they're doing with that. And right now, like, there's no, <laughs> there's really no way to find out. Um, but I would really like to see that. I'd really like to go there and. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to go there too. I'm just a bit <laughs> but I think some place I want to go is the Winchester Mystery House. Um, I not necessarily because I think the house itself is scary. I just think it's fascinating. The story behind it um, that she's haunted by the ghosts of people killed by the Winchester rifle or the Winchester gun. Um, and she had to keep building to confuse the ghosts, and once she stopped building, she was going to die. Something, it was something yes, along those something lines. Like that. And I just really want to go there because it sounds so crazy with staircases going to nowhere, doors that open up and there's a drop because they don't go anywhere. Yeah. I just think it would be a weird, mind-bending, Alice in Wonderland type experience. I think that would be really cool as well. And probably creepy just like opening doors to like empty walls. Something. Yeah. I don't know, I think just like thinking about that would be creepy, but I think it would be a cool place to as well. Go up a staircase and you just run it right into a wall. Yeah, and hopefully you don't fall back there. <laughs> I'm not sure how much free reign you have, but... Right. Like, it would be very cool to get lost there if, if you were allowed to have your own free reign, which I sincerely doubt. Maybe they have, like, signs that are, like, free reign. Well, I don't know. There's lots of virtual tours. <laughs> That's true. I think they have a virtual tour. It's paid, though. You have to pay for it. Ooh. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, Winchester Mystery House for me. I think that would be really cool as well. California. I was like, oh, road trip. Yeah. California. It's somewhere out west. Yeah. Road trip. <laughs> I think the, the Warren Museum is in Connecticut, so that's yeah, that's up in the northeast. It's not really anywhere doable though. It's still like quite a trek. Yeah. For a museum, not so to be public, so. Well, there is one that's closer that you mentioned in the first recording of this. Uh. The Waverly. Oh, Sanatorium. Waverly Hills Sanatorium. I desperately want to go to the Waverly Hills Sanatorium as well. Um, it is a former tuberculosis sanatorium. It's this five floor, like, literal monstrosity. Um, and I learned about it from watching a movie, but I think it's quite well known, especially if you like things like that or if you live like, relatively close. Mm -hmm. But there's, like, a tunnel underneath it that they use as a body shoot um, in the height of, like, the white plague being tuberculosis. Um, mm -hmm. So, they didn't want people to know how many people were dying, right. so they would use that. So, have you had any scary experiences in our museum? So, with our museum, I'm not sure if like it's real like scary experiences or if it's just in my head. Um, so, our building isn't like super large. You could yell from one end to the other yeah. you, if you desperately needed to, um, and the doors were all open. But we have this one part in our permanent exhibit that has lights that come on and off. Mm -hmm. So like, if you walk past, the lights come on. And it always just makes me really nervous to walk past it when I'm here alone or when I'm walking up and I'm the only person on this side of the building. And they like flicker at me. And it just makes me like really nervous. And then when we had the animals. I was, yeah, I can get that. I hated to be the one to shut down the exhibit when we had the animals. I felt like they were all looking at me, and it just, to go close the doors, I was just like, no, 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 I don't want to turn off the lights, 
And I would do like a thing where it's like, how the door open? I could like talk to the last light, which is off. Because I, it's like I thought they were going to move or something. I don't know what it was. Terrifying. Too much night at the museum. <laughs> that this was a nightmare at the museum. It really was, because that was scary. I don't know. Something about like, being that close to like the buffalo when you shut the door. Well, okay. <laughs> right out of here. Or when we were storing them and the bongo was literally staring at the light switch, like the door where the lights are, and he was just like, oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, I think it's probably the haunted dolls. Um, when I was doing an inventory sort of organization uh, in our collection storage, I found a box of dolls. They were not registered in our database, so we have a virtual or a digital database for all of our artifacts. Um, that box was not registered in our database at all, none of the items within or the box. So that was um, disconcerting. So I took them to the office and I started registering them and I went back to start organizing again and I found another box of dolls. And so I, at that point I started looking through the boxes and in total I found seven boxes of dolls that were not registered with, within our system at all. And some of them were definitely the archetype of haunted dolls. Yeah. Cracked porcelain faces, a wonky eye that sometimes opens. Uh, Literally the stuff is nightmares. <laughs> yeah, some were handmade, uh, Victorian looking dolls. Uh, scary enough that we used them for our Halloween history happy hour. So during our history happy hours now, we put out artifacts related to that history happy hour for people to look at. And we put out some of these dolls. They were scary enough that they were in our creepy collection. <laughs> they were. Uh, sort of layout that we had. Um, so I, I don't really scare easily. Um, I wasn't really scared of that situation. It was just definitely a moment where I thought, man, I'm probably cursed or haunted <laughs> now. Um, yeah. Why didn't anybody put these in the database? I was more frustrated with the situation than scared, but at the same time, it's a good story to tell people because it definitely does come off as creepy. Um, the other thing, too, is that piece of the wall that oh, we have. Yeah, that is, that one's just a weird, that one's weird. That one's weird. I don't know how scary it is, but it's definitely weird. We had somebody bring in um, a piece of what they believe is the Chitata wall, and there's, um, there's a lot of mythology surrounding that wall. Um, we don't even know if it was part of local legend or if it was real, but uh, we did have somebody believe they had found it and brought us a piece of it. And uh, there's there's stories about how it made technology go on the fritz when things are around it. And I'm not saying it's real, but our boss's computer definitely did crash when that wall uh, piece of the wall was brought into our office. And the Wi-Fi started messing up really badly around that same time. So like we're not saying it's real, but we're not saying that it's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and that could be the cause of all our computer problems now, too, because it's still in my office. Our boss does not want it in the building. But Lindsay keeps it in her office, and... I've never had a computer problem. Two hard drives, plus a laptop. Oh, yeah. Just broke. And we had all the, all the camera issues, so... Well, I think that was user error. <laughs> that was operator error. I'm going to blame it. On the wall. Yeah. On the rock. So, yeah, so those are some of the experiences that I've had here. Yeah, I also told Bessie, we have, there's oh, a local yeah. legend about um, a woman called Tall Bessie, and we use Tall Bessie for our Halloween history heavy hours as well, and we have a painting of her that it looks like she is staring right at you when you stare at the painting, and we also brought in a seven foot tall Tall Bessie mannequin, um, and when they brought it in, instead of just like putting it up or like storing it, they just like, laid it on a chair that we have in the lobby for us to walk out of the back office and think there's a dead body. Yeah, that definitely that definitely did startle me. I was, <laughs> that was like that was like a jump scare. Yes. Yeah. yeah you come out you come out of the office and there's a, a mannequin laying across the chairs. Yeah. So and, like wearing a home mask. Yes, yeah, she was wearing a horror mask 
too, so it was definitely a little extra creepy. Um, we had a similar situation with the mannequin. It might have been before you came. Do you remember Chris the mannequin? No, that was before. Okay, I came. we borrowed a mannequin uh, from one of our board members, and we called him Chris. I don't know why. I did not start that. I came when Chris was already here, and he was showing off, I believe, a Revolutionary War uniform. And he was around the rock wall, like in that corner. Oh. So when you pass him, that mannequin was right there. <laughs> so you would walk past, he was in a corner, a blind corner. So when you walk past, you could see him in his periphery. And then one of our, um, one of the people who worked here at the time put it in somebody's office. So that when they came in and opened their office door, it was the bookkeeper's office now. Chris was standing right there. <laughs> oh my I was I was not here for that uh, that surprise. I was here when he put it in there, but I wasn't here to see the reaction. Oh, that was I would have died. That would have been a lot. So, so last question today. Right. How do you feel about ghosts and curses? Well, well, I would love to say I don't believe in that. I think it's silly, but I can't. So, my whole life, weird things have happened. Um, I grew up, um, for a while in a house. It was an old house in a small town in Louisiana. This just sounds like a, this just sounds like the start of a bad movie. Um, it was built in the 1800s. The town has been there since, like, the early 1800s, late 1800s. Um, and this house has been there since, like, just after the Civil War, I think. Okay. Um, so quite a few people have lived and died in the house. And my mom is a huge fan of genealogy on literally everything, so she has done the genealogy of the house. So when I was a small child, I had an imaginary friend called Nina. And Nina lived at our house with us, and like I talked about her all the time, whatever. So my mom is doing the genealogy of the house, and in the 1920s, I think like 28, 29, a girl named Nina lives in our house with her family, and she was also in her 20s at the time, and I was like a wee tiny child. But Nina died in a car accident. Um, and then there's this cemetery behind the house. Um, it's probably like a block back behind the house. And her grave is there, and we like stumbled upon it once, um, which is kind of scary. Um, and then there was um, this guy, and this only happens one time, like one weekend of the entire year, that this one thing happens. Um, the back door, it's like an old like, wooden back door that no one really ever used, because it leads right into a bedroom, so it's not really like a room that you would use um, as a visitor, <laughs> like you right, would go right. the front. Um, but this door was like open, and you could hear it, it's very loud, you could hear it through the whole house, um, like slam shut, and you could hear these really heavy boot steps like up to about the like, midpoint of this dining room type room that we just use for like couches and beds and like extra stuff because there'd be a lot of people on one weekend. But you could always hear that and like rumor has it that it was this guy who like parents actually lived in the house and he was like shot outside of the house and he died on the way to the hospital because the ambulance got a flat tire, which sounds fake, but it didn't. Um, and then the last thing about this house, besides the fact that I find it terrifying, is that there's pecan trees in the backyard, and it's in a town called Colfax. There was a riot there called the Colfax Riot, in the name. Um, but it was like right after the Civil War during Reconstruction, and all these people ran out of the courthouse and they were shot, their bodies were buried, and they planted pecan trees over these bodies. And they're all over the town, and not as contest. But it's like dead creepy um, to think about that, that there's literal bodies buried in the backyard of the house, probably. I mean, we, the tree has since like fallen or been cut down, but no one was brave enough to like look, dig underneath it. But yeah, um, weird stuff like that kind of always happens to me. Um, so I just, that's a lot of coincidence. Um, a lot of weird stuff happens. So I can't say that I don't believe, especially because I guess it's a horrible, like, awful feeling. I'm scared to walk through the house by myself, so... You know, or I'm a chicken, also, also, I am a chicken, but that's fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I don't believe in any of that stuff. Um, 
I think that's in the nature of my job as a curator of collections. Um, and I used to be an archaeologist. So when you're dealing with human bones and the bodies of sacrificed guinea pigs in Peru, um, you don't think about, you can't believe in curses or being haunted. When I'm handling dead dolls or medical supplies or blankets somebody's probably died in, in the back, I can't think about being haunted or being hurt. But if I believed in it, I couldn't do my job. Um, so I definitely don't believe in hauntings or curses. I make jokes that I'm haunted or cursed um, because of the nature of my job, but I don't actually believe that I'm cursed or that I'm haunted by anything. See, if you told me I was cursed, I would, I would probably, if you were seriously, if you went out of your way to like pretend curse me, like I would think it's cursed. Like I would make it come true probably. Yeah, I, I I can't believe in it. I can't. You know, it's I I choose not to believe, but I I'm I'm always a skeptic about most things. <laughs> Bigfoot, absolute skeptic. I don't know. I think like a lot of it. Um, I think a lot of it makes me like self as well. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. So, Especially like, curses. Movies like Paranormal Activity, which like stem from a curse, uh, which is like the whole like franchise. I was like, okay, well, the woman was cursed, right? That's the spoiler alert. So sorry. Um, I can't have 10 years old, so Yeah, okay. I think we're saying. But, yeah, so she was, like, cursed, and then the old, this whole chain reaction. See, it's things like that that scare me, though. Um, I, I don't know, um, like, the movie The Nun, I just watched the trailer, and remember I was yeah. absolutely, like, losing it about that. And it's, I mean, uh, it's all the same, right? The demons and curses. And I was like, no, no, I can't. Send me a slasher. Any day. No, I, I'm not a big fan of horror movies or anything. I do watch, like, ghost videos and poltergeist videos on YouTube that are supposedly real. Uh, mostly because I'm looking for something that actually scares me, because I don't scare easily. But it's all, I don't believe any of it. I, it'll say, oh, this will definitely scare you. And I watch it. And there's a shadow. Like, I won't watch it. I'll be like, <laughs> like no, I can't. no. I I watch it and I I think, oh, a shadow. Ghost Adventure scares me. The the show where they like wear that helmet that's like a Christmas lights on it and they're like hunting for ghosts. I can't watch that. <laughs> I'm just saying there are a lot of videos out there where people find what they were looking for. That's true. And there are a lot of videos out there where, why were you recording at that moment? Yeah, like it's super handy that you just happen to be, yeah, I don't, I don't buy into, even though I don't really watch them, I don't really buy into the, the like ghost encounters videos, that's yeah. just not, that's not for me. Um, but if you were to tell me like a personal story about it, I'd be so much more likely to like, you know. Like listen or believe it than I would for a television show that has like 10 million viewers. Yeah, you're not going to get any <laughs> any of that from me. Um, I just I think curses are people seeing patterns. Our brain wants to see patterns, like pain cuts too. People talk about how they all died afterwards. Yeah, of cancer. <laughs> You would have like run right into the tomb, and I would have been like, yeah. "I'll wait out here. I'll just get lunch ready." Like, oh, when I was in the suicide forest, if I were in a horror movie, I would be that girl who reads the Necronomicon yeah, for fun. When I was in the suicide forest, my sister was so scared, so I brought up my phone and started reading the stories of the suicide forest. To her, just to freak her out. I'm the girl in the horror movies who reads the Necronomicon and gets everybody in trouble. I'm the one that lives. Because That's I'm fair. scared. Because That's I'm fair. scared. So I just, like, hide somewhere until the, or I pass out and end up in the hospital. Like, so I miss it. I'm the one who keeps saying, guys, this isn't real. And I get killed in the first couple of minutes. Or, like, probably the middle. The middle, yeah. I'm not sure I would be the final girl, but I would be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you would be you would be the scared girl who takes it seriously. I would be the girl who starts it all and finally gets poetic justice. <laughs> but you can't give me poetic justice right away. There needs to be a little bit. Somebody kill her. 
you like know, the, um, like on I know what you did last summer, the the red haired girl that like doesn't think it's real and she like it finally sees something happening and yeah. then she dies as soon as it's over. Yeah, you gotta have that you gotta have that girl for a while who says it's not real. If she says it's not real and gets killed in the first five minutes, you don't have the naysayer. You gotta have right. the naysayer for a little bit. So Well we have it's thrown out the spoiler alerts for two movies now, so darn. I know what you did last summer. It's so old. That's got to be more than 20 years old. I think it was 1999. I think so. Spoiler alert for a 20-year-old movie. So thank you for joining us for our first curator chat in person. And we will probably keep it up for a long time Yeah. for people to enjoy in the future for those who geographically can't come to us. Right. And once it's on the internet, it's on the internet forever. So it's reassuring. <laughs> I try. So thank you for watching. Join us next week. Sorry this one's a little bit late. We've been trying to figure out how to film in person, obviously. Um, third try. Third time is age time. Yeah. It's a learning process, but we'll see we you guys learning. next week. See ya.